our final and last speaker is um, Shirley Surya, um, who is an associate curator of design and architecture at M Plus, who will be speaking on reinterpreting modernism and modernities through the M Plus collection. Um, I'm going to read her profile a bit just to give you a bit of an introduction. Um, as part of building the collection at M Plus, Shirley Surya has researched and acquired works representing design and architectural developments in Greater China and Southeast Asia. She was co curator of Building M Plus, the Museum and Architecture Collection 2014, and Mobile M Plus, NeonScience.hk, which is actually a website exhibition. So if you have time, please, you can actually sort of like log on to uh, neonscience.hk um, to have a look at this uh, really extensive sort of like um, study of neon sign cultures in Hong Kong. And it's, she's also uh, co-organizing an upcoming exhibition on how Southeast Asia is framed through the M Plus collection. She was co-convener of Rethinking Pay, a centenary symposium uh, happened end of last year. Uh, Reorient Conversations on South and Southeast Asia 2017 and Asian Design His Histories Collecting and Curating 2012. Um, and she received her BA in Media Studies at the University of California, Berkeley, and MA in History of Design from the Royal College of Art in London. So can I sort of have um, Shirley up on stage? Thank you. Thank you all for, well, thank you, uh, Simon and Ilham and Rahel for inviting me here. I have to just say that, like, this is, uh, I'm so far from, from being able to be on equal kind of uh, footing of representing the kind of content that Roger and Tanavi and uh, Jiahui has presented. This is going to be like a living room chat, <laughs> almost like no, no paper per se, yeah? so in that sense. But I guess, um, you know, like it's, uh, okay, am I supposed to click something right now? Next, on the right. Yeah, yes, there you go. So it's, um, I was surprised at first when uh, Simon wanted to invite me here because I, I said, you know, I won't be dealing with a topic. I'm not a scholar to study one subject matter. But one thing I can say, if it's uh, something in, re in, in response to the term modernism, as in, you know, the kind of uh, subject matter that you're dealing with in this exhibition, I guess what I can offer is how um, me representing the curatorial team of design and architecture, but also the other disciplines in M+, uh, had sought to kind of not so much address uh, modernism, but what, is it, what does this term mean to us in our building of our collection? And how does it even help us to decide on what to acquire? And not just what to acquire, but when it comes and how do we interpret or reinterpret, uh, not just the object itself, but also the term like modernism or modernity. So, um, so whatever I'm gonna be saying um, in the next, hopefully 45 minutes or less, uh, it's pretty much going to be kind of like talking through the objects that we've acquired um, and, um, and how, how these questions have, uh, are, are, I guess, uh, kind of like are raised through the objects that we acquire. So at the moment, I, I just, uh, before that, I just wanted to kind of like, again, I, some sort of basis of uh, how I have defined, uh, not I, defined modernism, but the kind of reference points that I've been using, uh, partly part of my... Um, my time at, uh, at RCA when we have to deal with uh, modern architecture in China during the socialist period. People say modern architecture in China is dead and so that was when I had to kind of look at what does that mean, what does the term mean. Uh, and so this is just uh, kind of some quotes or rephrased quotes I guess uh, from three authors uh, of which I just kind of put it at the bottom there. Uh, everything from Paul Goldhagen, uh, sorry, Paul Greenhall uh, in the 1990s all the way to Hilda Heinen and all that. So basically, modernism itself could possibly be looked at. This is what from Paul, who had tried to kind of like see it as something or questioning, is it just a, a set of formal tropes? You know, is it just the flat roof, the simplicity? Uh, or is it something else that manifests from a core set of principles, like ideals or visions? And so some of these ideas about, okay, uh, as Paul said, decompartmentalization, which is basically the idea that, there's no, that, that the human experience is not meant to be Decompartmentalize. You're supposed to see it, experience it as a whole. Yeah, not just a furniture or a house, but the city is at the same time. It's about social morality because modernism at that point or the modern movement arise from a set of uh, almost the idea of trying to get rid of the class barriers. Okay, no longer about the kings, you know, the monarchs, but people are some sort of equality, a sense of equality where, where things are distributed, things could be used across the board. And the idea of total work of art, similar to de decompartmentalization as well, but more importantly, it's about 
these are all, I guess, when he was trying to de de dissect, I guess, dissect the modernism idea. He was looking at all the key texts by people from uh, the Distill movement in Holland, everything from what was happening in German Bauhaus uh, all the way to what Corp was writing in 19. 23 of his book in Towards the New Architecture. And so these are all just principles that he kind of put together. And so the idea of total work of art here means that, you know, there is no such thing as one discipline is superior to the other. Fine art is not superior to design and architecture, and therefore it all comes together. And so I think when you said that focus on architecture, and that yes, I will focus on architecture, but M plus it's a multidisciplinary museum, and so we actually acquire across the board and not just one discipline. And this is a, great, a way in which I, I would like to say that it is how we respond to the idea of modernism, is that we look at across the disciplines. Technology. Technology here is not so much about just uh, it's advanced technology for the sake of being able to distribute uh, or, or make available objects uh, in an affordable manner. I guess this is all based on the principles from the, you can call, pioneer modernism movement, uh, which is all in the pre-war, 1920s to 1930s, and then later on it would advance to something else, and even function, or anti-historicism, which is really, I mean, this is still a contentious point, because at the moment we, we were looking at what does it really mean? Is it about not using uh, motifs or, or, or styles from the past that would evoke memory, or is it just um, you can use the historicist uh, motif, but for a different reason, and not just to evoke memory. Would that be? Would that qualify as modernism? So this is just a question, an abstraction as so-called the pure universal form of experience, as opposed to something that is figurative that needs to be interpreted via a particular cultural lens, and also the idea of universal internationalism. So kind of cutting across national barriers. Again, these principles were derived at a moment when there were wars, when there were divisions between countries, and so designers and architects were really trying to go beyond those barriers, and so they, they aspire to a sort of like a universal vision. So these are just some ways, but of course, uh, people like uh, Hilde Heinen and uh, Hubert Jan Hanket, they came up with another way of seeing what modernism in summary could be, which is pretty much modernism as artistic and intellectual ideas that reflect the effects of various degrees of ruptures within tradition, resulting from modernities as conditions of living imposed by socioeconomic processes of modernization. And so you could tell that the three different ways of seeing modernism, modernities as modernization are, you know, the, the, I guess the subtle difference uh, in terms of source and effect uh, could be seen from, 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 their, from their writings. So I'm just laying this out because I, as I'm trying to process, uh, I gotta say that whatever I'm trying to process here doesn't come from like many years of research. This is the first time that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of pushed to reflect on it a little bit, so it is rather premature, but uh, you know, I guess, I guess you can raise your questions later if you don't agree with how I'm seeing it. And so I just wanted to say about some sort of, I guess I use the word, principles for orientation at M+, uh, based on all these things. I just wanted to say that we don't, you know, we don't, oh, we wish we have the luxury of uh, pursuing a subject matter and then go deep and like look at all the resources. We collect objects. And when we collect objects, we have to find the objects. And when we find the object, we can get permission for the objects. And so sometimes we can't get the object that we want. And therefore, sometimes the stories that we tell are not complete because depending on what these objects uh, could be found or even entering the collection. And therefore, because it's incomplete, they are largely in the form of frag fragments. So the things that I'll be showing on my slides are definitely things that are already in the collection. I'm not using any objects or examples that are out there uh, which I could fully tell the story of, but it is basically based on what we have acquired so far since 2012. And uh, another approach that M Plus takes is it's cross-geographical. Even though we are a museum based in Hong Kong, we are focusing on Asia, but Asia itself uh, is always, I guess the word is transnational here for us because we do not believe in understanding culture within one discipline or, or one geography and believing that culture has always kind of like, yeah, cross boundaries and it's a uh, migration of ideas as well as objects and, and people and agents and so on. And so, yeah, I've addressed the interdisciplinary nature or approach that we take. It is also the idea of modernism for us is always multiple, uh, not one, I guess, also because of how the word modernism has been used by different people and it's situated, it is based on where it is. Uh, and so we try to understand it as where it's coming from and why did it, why do people have certain decisions over how certain forms actually uh, manifest. And we are, I think, and I think, I guess, in, I gotta use the word phenomenon and shifts because in the beginning we we didn't come out to say, okay, we are going to be the modern and contemporary art museum. We didn't never, we never use that term. Modern and contemporary is almost like I guess it's good that we thought about it. I guess and kind of like question what that means. But I think we were more interested in kind of like asking the, 
very broad question like what was happening? What was the, what were the changes? What caused the changes? And so, and we are more interested in phenomenons and, and, and shifts uh, than so much, okay, let's just collect what is so-called modern or what is contemporary per se, but really looking at what are the objects or what are the works that arise out of a certain situation and condition. And, uh, and also the point and counterpoint idea here means that, yes, we, I use the word counterpoint because uh, I guess it's funny because like there's this curator, okay, I think it's Paula Antonelli from MoMA, when we talk about postmodernism in that sense, what was happening in the late 70s all the way to the 80s or Michael Graves stuff, she's like, no way is MoMA is going to collect that. We are a modern art museum. Uh, we don't collect POMO uh, in that sense. And then for us, we're like, why? You know, like, you know, it's because for us, um, it's about enriching the story. You know, modernism is not something absolute. In fact, its strength is, uh, is a, uh, its strength or its effect has resulted in the fact that people care about its inadequacy or even failures, and therefore POMO itself is something worth documenting. And so we are interested in both the, the thing and the counter thing. So, and in the last bit there, uh, the last two bit there is macro and micro histories, and that's got to do with the big picture, what's happening, but also the stories of the, of the figure, of the person. And that kind of relates back to the formal social, historical, and biographical approach. We are, we are rather quite particular about um, acquiring objects or works based on the storyline of a person's development. And so even if the person's development or, or, or the architect changes over time, we would still be very interested. We're not looking for a consistent, I guess, kind of a trajectory per se, but just like what actually led to the changes. So that's just like a background of how uh, the thinking behind some of the objects that I will share here. And so, uh, just, just again, this is just like something that I, I just wanted to share that we, this is where we're going to be in 2020 spring opening is in Hong Kong. It's on the Kowloon side. And you could tell the rectilinear form is so called, you can, someone can say, oh, very modern. Yeah, sure. It's like, yeah, it's very simple, super simple structural uh, by Herzog and de Miron. And, uh, and just to mention again, that these are the three key disciplines in which we try to collect. Uh, there are no departments in the museum. We have different teams uh, of uh, different specialization for, uh, for subject matter, but we share the same, uh, same acquisitions committee, and you could imagine that people all have to understand uh, where each other is coming from and try to explain things uh, from an expert level, but also from a level that everybody can understand. So that's the, the approach that we take. Uh, and so it's moving image, design and architecture, and visual art. And this is just something that I've shown before in my introduction about M+. Um, it's focusing on 20th and 21st century, and, uh, and the idea of the, the region here focusing is Hong Kong, China, uh, and other regions uh, of Asia and the rest of the world. That's the geographies that we actually kind of focus on, but of course our, our core is still Asia, and from there it's in dialogue with other parts of the world. And also, uh, just a key word, just to mention again, uh, we are very concerned with the global movement of ideas across time and space, and we will strive to reflect the multi-centered, transcultural, and transnational context of today's visual cultural developments. And therefore, uh, in relation to how these things uh, apply to Hong Kong, it will be to do with Hong Kong's past and present place in the world as a way, as a lens, I guess, of how we actually look at the world. So yeah, so that's kind of like, I'm just starting with this image. Uh, this is an image of Imperial Hotel in Tokyo. Um, so I am starting with this because the very first group of materials that we acquire um, is actually Frank Lloyd Wright's drawings of uh, Imperial Hotel in Tokyo. And again, if you, I guess if for people who know what it means to get drawings like these, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, yeah, it's, it's a serendipity, I, I would say. Uh, but why do we take it up? It's because pretty much, even though in our minds we're like, okay, we'd rather get a means or something like that, right? No, it's not. We give, you have no such preference. I, just, I guess for us, we, we didn't, we, okay. How do, if, if somebody knows that Frank Lloyd Wright was excluded in the exhibition called International Style because he refused to be part of it. And even though uh, Philip Johnson actually invited him, there were like a series of correspondences between the curator and the architect in the archive uh, to show that. So I guess in a, in a, in a, because he's not, people think that he's not part of the international style. But the thing is, does it really matter? Because what happened, I guess people, I'm just referring to this image again. This is like a, a lot of people consider uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, design for the Imperial Hotel as very pre-Columbian, pre-Columbian like Mayan basically. And, uh, and, and to some people, oh my gosh, it's completely historicist. And, but it's not, if you look at the drawings, uh, I guess if you, in, in close detail, this is only six drawings out of like a whole bunch that is av available at the Frank Lloyd Wright archive. You'll see that he is highly systematic and ornament, or, I use the term system ornamental, in how he come up with, you know, the, I guess decoration for him is, is systematic. It's not so much about something that is pure surface and it's very much tied to the structure that was actually withstood the earthquake in Tokyo. Um, and so it's kind of um, a lot of, a lot of, uh, 
thing about this building that really questions like, is this modern or not? You know, but I think if you want to look at modernism itself, the term, it's, it's something that is not cut off from like Art Nouveau or Art, Art Deco or even uh, the work band movement in Germany because they were all traces that actually further developed and got, cons got distilled by, by a group of people during the 20s. So it's not so much a very clear cut. And so he belongs to that thing um, where nature to him was really the, the kind of like departure point as opposed to just pure machine or, or um, uh, mechanical uh, living. So it's kind of, uh, that's, that's for Frank Roy. So we acquired that and we acquired the furniture that came with it. And so it's funny because I, I just realized that this image actually has all the chairs stacked behind the wall. And so that's, that's the, the chair that we got. And so in a way, yeah, so we acquired this without caring whether it's modern or not. We just knew that Frank Lauer was a, a key, this project was a key uh, narrative for us where we cared so much about the idea of the transnational architectural practice as early as the 20s. Uh, and of course, there are much more other examples, but he being a more like an icon, I guess, or a major influence, influencer uh, of, of, of modern and contemporary practice, therefore we, we thought it's important to get this work. And, uh, and this is uh, another serendipitous find. Um, so it's not just about Japan because things are available. We have always wanted to get something from China, Art Deco. But if you all know about how hard it is to find materials in China in that period, they, they don't survive. They are either in the municipal offices, which is completely shut, archives no longer there, and it belongs to the government. But this is the furniture that we found of uh, the furniture, a uh, cafe, hotel, suite furniture, which is the desk, uh, a bed, a planter, and a wardrobe with the same the same pattern, marquetry design, of basically Egyptian Art Deco, which actually also appears in the rooftop and other parts of the building uh, of Cathay Hotel, which was designed by Palmer and Turner, uh, also established in Hong Kong, but practicing in both Shanghai and Hong Kong uh, in, the, in the 30s. And so the question, like, why do we acquire this? But this is very much part of our desire. Uh, I, use the term, I use the term to our, our curatorial team, you know, why, why do you want to acquire Art Deco? And like, well, it's not so much about Deco per se, but I think we are interested in the tracking the various shifts of modernity in China itself, uh, not just modernism in a kind of classic uh, sense of only what was happening in the 40s by certain architects, but even the foreign architects, what was, whatever that's happening then. And so Cathay being the beginning of the break, this is the first hotel that was a break from the neoclassical kind of a mode, but really uh, a, a different kind, a de yeah, a different kind of art deco, which is, happens to be Egyptian as claimed by the architect who, who designed it. So again, this is just, uh, again, you can tell that we are quite, expanded, I guess, in our, in our understanding of our interest in, in the modern. Uh, but of course, you know, like this is a, another, uh, it's about 26 photographs by Lucien Hev uh, of, uh, of the projects by, by Corbusier and, and Jeanne Ray uh, in, in India, so both Chandigarh as well as Ahmedabad. And again, this is the, you know, people ask like, why do you acquire this? And people ask like, why is Chandigarh important? Yes, you can deny the canonical figure, but this is was pretty much the, the influencer for influencer, but also a, an example where people react against. Uh, a lot of architects in India also react against this canonical figure and what they were doing and try to come up. It's a, it's a push enough to go into another direction. And so we thought this is a key one. But I think the idea of the modern uh, uh, and its role in really nation building, not just in India, but also in Southeast Asia was a key one. And that's, therefore, we actually felt like this is a very important part of our, we were interested in the, in the narrative of nation building within Asia and how whether it's architects from outside or, or in the country were engaged in this production or in this carving of this new identity uh, from the past uh, was a key role. So we also got the concrete street lamp and um, and yeah, so it's just, and also there's another wardrobe that I, not, I did not put here of the uh, Mill Owners Association building wardrobe, but I didn't put it here. There are many more things I didn't put, but that's just the idea. Uh, and so yeah, this is another one uh, that we, this is the only Mies uh, sketch, okay, you could completely, I could almost, this is so fetishistic, you know, like, uh, but you know, like there's just no, no way around uh, how, how hard objects come by a museum, and when it comes, we have to decide whether we get it, and we did. And this is a sketch of the courthouse in 1933. Uh, but Mies is really, it's more about, about fetish again for us. Uh, it's the same idea. Uh, whatever that I'll be showing after this will be example of works uh, by architects in Taiwan and Hong Kong that was really reacting to this. And they are both, um, and so I just have to kind of say the idea of the courthouse, the museum box, the kind of uh, open plan, the transparency, you know, all of these were very much explored by architects uh, after today, I guess, in all the, all the condominium um, sale houses, they still remain to be glass boxes after so many years. So, yeah. And uh, so this is just the first figure that I just wanted to bring up. Uh, Wang Ta Hong is an architect in, uh, uh, he's born in mainland. Uh, he was actually China's foreign minister's uh, son, only son, 
but uh, he went trained in Cambridge, also trained in Harvard University, GSD, uh, Graduate School of Design under Gropius. And this article uh, actually featured his work alongside other students' works, and it's about the prefab unit. And as you can see, uh, I mean, uh, Gropius is really not so much like a Mies person, so it's not so much about the expression of, of the space, it's really about the making of the building, and so using technology uh, to make uh, units uh, affordable, available as, as widely as possible was really his core. So this, this article is meant to kind of like pay tribute to what to Gropius' students and his teaching, and Wang Tahong is one of them. Uh, and I just wanted to bring it up because, of course, we acquired his, uh, the it's not really archive in that sense of a fullness, but whatever, the, the National Taiwan Museum have already has a very strong movement of acquiring all the drawings by Taiwan architects, so we got his personal folders of articles, sketches, and notes, and so this is just one of the things that remain in that folder that we acquired. And so when we got this, uh, we felt, okay, um, we also realized that his other works, this is another project called the Atrium House, Townhouse, and as well his very first uh, building, which is a house which is completely a box, basically, uh, in, 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 in Taipei. This is 1953, and it was, uh, if you ever read the Taiwan Architecture Journal, this was like a revolutionary house that really kind of sent waves across the, uh, the scene, because like, why is it so darn like, simple and uh, Spartan, I guess the word is Spartan. And for him, even though he's a student of Gropius, Mies was inevitably his influence, and he had written about it, and the Miesian box. So, but then at the same time, he would also claim that it's not just about the Miesian box that I'm trying to, I'm trying to um, um, pay homage to, but also the idea of the walled house, of the Chinese walled house. And so the courtyard, I mean, as opposed to something that you could see from outside, is completely covered up uh, with landscaping and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and just the path that walks into the, the house itself, this garden, Chinese garden. So there are many things about it where even if you consider someone like Mies uh, to be your master or your influencer, I guess uh, uh, Wang Tahong also had these notes uh, in his archive that actually said, what is uh, the modern Chinese architecture, modern architecture for China? Uh, so he is already part of that discourse and trying to discover what that meant uh, in his, for his generation and for his period. And so this is just his attempt to do that. So I think, uh, again, people could go even deeper into, his, uh, into this project, but at the moment, this is how we acquire supposedly the, the students of the so-called that modern master, but at the same time, we believe that there are many more um, kind of, a, I guess you can say, mutations or appropriations or just completely transformation, I guess, from what they were taught. Um, and so, this is just another example of uh, Wang Tahong. Uh, even, okay, if you've been to Taiwan, the Palace Museum that you see today is, uh, uh, this is actually the wedding design. The Palace Museum of today was actually the second, uh, was the first runner-up, basically. But then, if you knew about Taiwan's politics, uh, at that point, uh, the very extreme uh, Sino, yeah, you know, just Sino signification, I guess you can say, uh, of the Chinese style, the Chinese roof was very much politically the correct thing to do. And so, obviously, even though the architect jury actually uh, chosen his work, which is, again, based on that uh, kind of like very uh, boxy, museum box kind of like a museum, he did not win. Uh, the other guy got it. Uh, but it just speaks of what, he, what he was he trying to do with the Palace Museum for, for you know, for a collection from, from China to be housed in this building. What does it say about modern architecture in China? I think it was, it was a really big statement. But, and yet, it wasn't the right time for it, and so it never got built, right? Someone else got built. And then, so this is the one it is right now, if you've been to Taipei. Um, so highly palatial. Yeah, and so, and, but then this is another one. Okay, so this is another, uh, another example where... Uh, he had to build another very institutional building that paid tribute to Sun Yat-sen, which is the founder of modern China, both in Taiwan, but also in, yeah. So it's just, it's just a, uh, so this is why he said that form of the roof was meant to be the Chinese court, court, uh, court, uh, court, is, I guess court, court official, the, the hat of a classic Chinese court official. Uh, and yet, you can see in the final design, <laughs> Uh, they were, he was kind of forced to kind of go all the way to the Chinese roof idea as opposed to the court official hat. And so it's kind of a really, you could see that the, the, the politics was pushing him to go into this complete historicist mode of just using the, the, the form of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a classical roof as opposed to the idea of a, of a, court, of a court official hat. And so you could tell that even as a so-called an architect with this set of beliefs um, in not just mimicking uh, a particular form, uh, he had to bow down, I guess, in some sense, uh, to this. And so I guess in a way, like, it wasn't, uh, yeah, it wasn't, uh, I guess, the idea of how much are you able to practice or exercise these beliefs, you know, even form, when form itself becomes political, uh, is, uh, yeah, there's a limitation to it. And so we are interested in that, in this, in that kind of stories as well. 
So back to this. So this is, I'm just returning to Hong Kong now. Um, this is, um, I, I've always, uh, we actually put the Mies uh, uh, illustration next to a student work uh, called Jackson Wong uh, at, the, at the big exhibition that we did called Building and Plus, the Museum and Architecture Collection. By the way, I've been speaking not on the mic. Is it, am I, have I been audible? I've been, yes. It's kind of far away, but no problem. So, so this, um, this is a student work called Jackson Wong. Jackson Wong was part of the first batch of architecture students led by Gordon Brown. Gordon Brown was the, was, uh, came from Architectural Association uh, to Hong Kong and set up the department in 1952. And so uh, you can tell that if you look closer to this drawing, uh, it's actually called Drawing of a Chinese Professor's Courtyard House. So courtyard house, again, it's the same kind of uh, notion of uh, the courthouse. And so it's, uh, and you could see the, the plan itself is, uh, but it is the difference that it is built around a Chinese garden. But at the same time, the, the plan and all that is very much based on the Mesian open plan again. And so it's kind of, um, uh, for us, we put it together because we just wanted to talk about what it means to be, to be uh, influenced by, by Mies for the very first generation of architecture students in Hong Kong. And so uh, Jackson Wong himself, even after he graduated, the first residential house that he built is called The Box. Um, it's 1961. Um, and then after that, he went on to build another one called, yeah, his own residence in 1966 in still the similar manner. Um, and so, yeah, the idea of the fair face concrete and all that, it's, it's, it's really, yeah, the language just permeates, right? You just cannot help but have to, to really uh, demonstrate this uh, uh, as, as an architect. Uh, it's just a very personal project because even in a hospital that he designed, uh, it was also in fact concrete, um, and so it was an Adventist uh, hospital. And also Jackson Wong later on became the founder of a very important firm in, in, in Hong Kong called the Wong, Wong and Ouyang, who also happened to be building, uh, uh, de uh, designing the, 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 the Lipo Center now, but then it was called the Bond Center with Paul Rudolph. And so I, I just, I'm just saying like, again, this is all kind of like, disparate kind of connections, but I'm just saying like, this is how the practice developed and their influencer and what, who they came to collaborate with even towards the end are all classical figures of that, that network of the, the GSD Bauhaus trained architects. And so I uh, just wanted to bring up again, uh, even uh, this, is a, this is Peak Tower uh, in Hong Kong. It was the first pretty much tourist destination uh, this is not the peak tower today. Uh, this is, today is the second peak tower. This is the first one. And it was designed, it was, it was commissioned after the riots uh, in, in Hong Kong in 1960s. Uh, there was a major riot due to the Cultural Revolution in China. And so Hong Kong was at its really low point of like not having a sense of confidence. A lot of people actually left. So the government together with the Kaduri, which is a real estate developer who owned the Hong Kong and Shanghai hotels, actually, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna build a new landmark at the top of the hill where everybody could see. And this has to be a strong fortress, like a very strong icon of confidence uh, for Hong Kong. And so Chong Wanan, who is trained in Bartlett, um, actually designed this, but for him, it was very clear. It was gonna be something based on the Chinese um, uh, fire, like kind of a wall fort. It's a fort, basically, where you have your fire burning, uh, like a great wall in China type type of thing. So that was his his main idea of, of the form behind behind this uh, peak tower uh, peak tower. And so it's kind of I guess so. I'm just saying like it's an example where yes, you can be someone completely uh, trained uh, all the way in the UK, but when you come and build something for Hong Kong at a particular time, what will be your symbol of strength or like confidence or kind of a resilience? It's actually the Chinese wall uh, fortress, basically. So it's kind of a it's, you, can, you can think of it as random, but I guess that's what Chong Wanan actually believed in. Uh, but this is a highly, uh, this is one of the most um, uh, tricky engineering project as well in Hong Kong. And, 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 and it was, it, I think it speaks of its confidence as well and it's actually a really amazing project. So another one is this. So I guess this is an example of, um, so this is Meifu Sanchun. It's not a public housing estate. It's actually a private housing estate developed by Mobile, the patrol, patrol company. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's actually, one of the first um, massive city within a city comprehensive uh, development of uh, private housing, even before the, the public housing actually took on this form. And, um, and for us, when we first saw this, you know, like we got to get my Meifu, but we didn't have in mind like modern or not. We just know that this is such a, a prototypical kind of a development in Hong Kong and they were the first to start it. And I guess if you want to look at the very and I guess, yeah, and so I, I'm just saying like, these are, these are ideas that could have existed in the 20s and 30s in Europe on paper, but it was completely just executed and built like really uh, quickly, of course, with capital and all that, and also a boom in development and, of, and the need for housing in, in Hong Kong, and just making it possible without much de-rising of it, it's just built. And so for us, I think Hong Kong is an example where 
you really just, uh, we really, I think the, the word phenomenon for us is much more important. Uh, and to see the, the diversity in uh, architecture production and documenting it is much more key for us than so much about an authored project. And so this is another one by, by the same uh, architecture firm, uh, but in Taiku. And so it's all, and you could tell that this, um, this drawing, which is all about its blocks, yeah, this is Taiku Sheng became the model for many housing estates, private again, uh, in all over Hong Kong. So we required uh, all these uh, materials as well. And I guess what accounts for infrastructure, uh, we thought Hong Kong is not so much a city with, with a lot of, uh, you know, to us it's really an agglomeration that is a key thing about Hong Kong and the idea of the logistics and architecture being infrastructure and not just merely uh, a nice corporate building or a house, but also all these other aspects. So we had acquired the logistics center uh, right by the port in, uh, in, 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 in Qingyi, as well as in a, a substation, an electric station by Palmer and Turner. So the language is all there, but they are all really highly utilitarian projects uh, that we felt are part of the story of Hong Kong and not so much about modernism or not per se. But again, but if you want to look at the, the, the tenets or basic tenets of modernism and what it's meant to be uh, to serve um, kind of a being, you know, not about, not about class or it's really about serving the, the city and all that, it's, they, they pretty much uh, fulfill that, that criteria. And how about mess and chaotic, chaos, right? So this is probably the only project uh, in Hong Kong that is of such, even though they actually characterize a lot of the urban characteristics in Hong Kong as well. So Kowloon Walt City was what we wanted to very uh, much uh, uh, document or acquire. So everything, all the photographs that are taken by Ian, uh, Ian, Ian, Ian Lambert as well as Greg Gerard in the 80s when they were documenting it before it was torn down, uh, the mess uh, and uh, the rooftop, uh, play, rooftop as playground for the kids and the highly, you know, just almost like seamless, I guess, development of blocks across uh, the uh, completely unregulated became, but at the same time, unregulated, but actually quite humane because we got the videos of the documentation of life within the streets by Swin Ho uh, of people just selling pork, dim sum, but also having kindergartens and nursery and so on and so forth. So they are really, yeah, so I think Kowloon Wall City to us is an example where we just go for phenomenon and something that was important to the city as opposed to so-called any sort of a style or a movement per se. And again, I go back to another figure, uh, which is familiar to some here. Um, uh, so we acquired um, the archives of uh, Architects Team 3 in Singapore, but with materials that are stretching from 59 all the way to the 80s uh, uh, as uh, projects that are run by uh, Lim Chong Kiet. And uh, of course, when someone looks into the bio of Lim Chong Kiet, uh, apart from being trained for, at Manchester, but also at MIT and Gyogi Kapesh being a, a very key one, and if you know the and, uh, and Gyogi Kapesh's influence on the idea of the structure and the vision, uh, vision, the visuality of structure, uh, is a very much key influence in all, I guess if you see all of uh, Lim Chong Kiat's buildings, of course they were all designed as a team, not just himself, uh, but they were, all, um, they were all pretty much highly kind of, um, yeah, this is a very, very clear, very highly rational building. Um, and I think this is something that is, we, we acquired it not so much about his kind of, uh, approach to design per se, you know, but really just how important the project meant uh, to, to Singapore uh, at a time uh, during the transition into, into kind of like separation uh, from, Malaysia, uh, from Malaysia itself. And so, and so this is an example where I guess, like what I said before, uh, how does uh, modernism or the modern movement mean to architects who were employed, uh, you know, kind of as fairly as through competitions um, to, build, um, to build something that is symbolic for the nation. Uh, this is the very first uh, kind of like major conference kind of hall center, but also for the trade union and all that. And so, yeah, what does it speak of public space? What does it speak of transparency, of, uh, of leading access to, to public, for the public to come in? And so all of that, and even the notion of the tropical as well, what does it mean to, to, to build for, for this kind of uh, climate, even though he's not very kind of, uh, he's not, I mean, he's not, he's, he's, his communication about the, of, the, of the building is not so much couched in that manner, uh, but is the sensitivity is definitely there. And I think it's, he's a very, this is another, another uh, we are commissioning the model of this mosque um, because uh, it is a key one where so-called building a religious structure is not so much based on purely uh, ethno-religious kind of motifs or, or form, but really uh, almost highly geometric and highly engineered. This is also his uh, Arab's uh, project, uh, his collaboration with Arab in, in, in Southeast Asia. And so we, we thought this is a very key project. And so modernism is, because I think there's another quote which I used in the, in the last presentation at MMDA, which is the notion that to, to Mr. Lim, like modernism should not just be something about 
trying to express pure identity, but it's, a, it's also a means in which uh, technology as well as aesthetics could continue to progress. And so I, I guess from the buildings we could tell that I think to him it's not so much about identity kind of like uh, politics per se, but really just about the building and what you can do to create new forms and uh, inventive and imagination. And so this is other buildings that uh, other parts of the archive that we've acquired. Uh, of course, the key uh, DBS headquarter, the first DBS headquarter in, Hong, uh, in Singapore, as well as the Jurong Town Hall. And so now I'm moving somewhere else, some, some other place again. Um, communist uh, socialist architecture in China is a key one for us to show how we are really expanding this term of modernism. And so Wu Yingxian is a photographer, but he used to be a cinematographer uh, in the 30s of, uh, of, uh, of rightist, oh, sorry, leftist, uh, leftist films, yes, so to, promote, to help to kind of propagate the communist uh, party's uh, ideals, but as like, as like very progressive youth in the 30s. Uh, and so you could tell that that's his picture on the left. And then later on when he became the propaganda photographer and also filmmaker for the communist party, and that's him on the right. And so these photographs that we acquired, uh, again, it's so hard to get, you know, I, can't, I can't imagine getting any drawings of Great Hall of the People. This is completely out of reach. But we got uh, photographs by Wu Yingxian, and he was the, because he was the pro propaganda photographer for the Communist Party, he was the only one who was commissioned um, to photograph this building inside, outside, uh, as well as um, for a commemorative uh, publication. Uh, in, it actually, the commemorative publication is in the 70s, but then the building was designed in 59. And so it was... Um, it's something that we felt, I guess uh, a lot of people, if you read some of the books like Edward Dennison and all that about architecture in China, they would, he would completely deny that, that this is of any so-called modern significance uh, because modern is almost like M-O-D-E-R-N-E -E in that sense, but this is really, uh, to us, modernism, socialist modernism also encompasses, includes the kind of socialist realist because it was a, a very deliberate break that he's trying to make with the capitalistic countries uh, where where so-called the flat roof and simplistic forms are, or, or abstraction are, are highly elevated, and now it's back to the, to the kind of like highly figurative or almost neoclassical, but also if you see the, the patterns that are in the columns, uh, you would see all these uh, reference being made to traditional Chinese architecture as well. So it is a mix, completely a hybrid, um, and yet uh, we felt that this is a key building that we should acquire for, in terms of documenting. These are all the rooms that are in the, in the, in the album. Uh, of his of this building, and I felt it was completely an image of a slightly contradiction, or not contradiction, but like it's you really can't tell what it is anymore. You can't tell that it's a socialist realist, or then you see the furniture and the way it's built. You know, it's coming from the 40s and the 50s, and so it's just yeah, you just there's just no way to label it and easily categorize it. I think I think such complexity is needed in how we acquire objects, and all the objects that we actually acquire need to tell such complex story where it's not just easily categorizable. And, uh, and then the next project that we acquired from him, oh, of his photograph, is the Beijing Hotel. So Beijing Hotel is the East Wing. Uh, it was built in, during the early reform era of China, so before 79 and when it opened our policy. But at that point, hotel was the site of diplomacy and openness to the foreign influences, I guess. And so Beijing Hotel became that example. So from the outside, it's completely this, you know, like you could tell that it could be built in the 20s, 30s, boxy and all that. But inside is all these gilded golden columns. Um, and so it's just a mix. And then there's this very kind of like completely 40s, you can almost call it mid-century Californian like bedroom. And so it's just a mix. Everything is a mix. And the references are from everywhere. And it's okay. Like it's, that's the whole point of it. These are the references that the architects themselves have from journals that they have in the library from the 30s, 40s. Uh, and, and then, um, but then there are you know, no other media coming in in the 60s. And so this is the, they are, they are all these very hybrid uh, references are, are, are appearing in, these, in this design of the interiors of the hotel. And, and so we go on uh, with collecting also products as well as uh, posters of that period and even journals, uh, comic, comic magazines of that period. Just kind of like, you know, all these sources, I guess you could use the, I use the term visual culture as methodology because we don't just rely on one medium to tell a story anymore, but really the whole, the whole network of uh, mediated uh, kind of like uh, phenomenon. And so yeah, I'm moving to the last bit now, which is POMO. Uh, this, uh, two this is only some of the drawings that we acquired as a, as a group of drawings that we found uh, from a collector in the States, of course, who had collected everything from Michael Graves to Bernard Shumi. And, um, and when we asked ourselves, are we going to get this? You know, and like, we felt, you know what, this, even though we don't necessarily agree with all that Graves has done, Okay, you call it Disney World or Disneyland architecture, uh, and you know, led to grave results, I guess, in many buildings all over the world. But then it's still a key thing to show and to tell the story of and represent what was really happening. And so we, we acquired them. And, um, and I just wanted to kind of uh, go a little bit. We also acquired Zaha Hadid's peak, and why? And so what would you consider her? Sure, she was in the deconstructionist, kind of deconstruction, deconstructive 
uh, sorry, deconstructionist uh, architecture exhibition in MoMA, um, as with together with uh, Bernard Shumi and all that. But but to, I guess for us uh, in Amplas, we are interested in this movement, uh, not so much in its absolute form, but also the kind of transformation that it had led to. So POMO itself being a very self-reflective uh, self -reflective movement where there is an object image dichotomy and people are realizing that there's no longer a way in which you can control how a project is defined by itself. The object or the building can no longer define itself on its own terms, but it is beginning to be defined by discourse, defined by images, defined by media, defined by discourse and so it's just um, the instability uh, is something that we we actually felt was very important to acquire to document and to represent in in the collection and even we believe that something like a hadith's projects is really a result of that so-called freedom the opening up uh, from a form yeah from one absolutist form and therefore we and of course uh, hadith this project for peak Tower, for peak block was key for us because it was pretty much her unbuilt project, but from then on, it kind of uh, led, led into world, frame, world fame for her. But also, if you see another painting of, of the peak block, it's actually rising above of the city of Hong Kong. So the, completely, the, all those like pencil towers were like underneath uh, the peak block uh, as almost like the basis in which she came up with this very floating, kind of like unstable um, uh, uh, design for, for, the, for the, it's actually a clubhouse. So, uh, so yeah, and this is moving to Thailand now. Um, this is a recent acquisition of Sumat Jumsai. So people ask, of course, like, are you sure you're going to acquire this? Again, I, I think by now it's very clear that we acquire materials or works um, really not so much about, no more, not the taste, you know, the question of taste uh, is, is key, sure. Uh, there's still a degree of that, but more and more it is really about what does a work mean to discourse and how does the work reflect a discourse or a reaction to a particular discourse. And we believe that Sumat Jumsai is pretty much uh, very rarely uh, one of the key architects in Southeast Asia without claiming to be Southeast Asian, zero discourse on tropical architecture. Uh, in fact, even though we realized that, uh, we realized that his buildings, actually, I'll show you, show you okay, just jump a little bit. Jump here, j let me jump here, okay, here. Oops, Doop. okay. So that one is called School for the Blind by Sumat Jumsai. Uh, 1972, 1973, completely, he said, this is an homage to Mr. Cobb, you know, like, I just, I just, he's my master, and I, I adore him, but if you look at, there are other materials here, it's completely, the bristle and all that, it's all, and, and then, I guess over here, it's an open kind of a, uh, uh, kind of, yeah, you can almost tell the idea of the tropical is something embedded in this, in this design, it's not something that he's, he's completely aware of it, but he never called it such, and he never wanted to be part of such a discourse in that sense. And so uh, it was only later on when he took on, uh, when he was much more aware of what it means by, by appropriating dye architecture into one of the university design, then he would actually, the Tamasa University, then he would be much more, uh, I guess, kind of like uh, self-conscious about it. But generally, from the start, this is his first building in, Th in Bangkok, is the British Council building. Uh, and so he loves uh, Corp and the machine for living to him is a, you know, is a motto for, for his, his own, but, but at the same time, he wants to kind of subvert it. So the idea of machine for living, okay, let me just humanize the machine here. So this is the beginning of his, um, you can, uh, the beginning of him kind of like understanding, yes, sure, I love, I love what I learned from uh, Corbusier, but I'm also trying to find out if there's another way of seeing what the machine meant. And so let me just make, humanize the machine by using a form that is almost recognizable. This is a toy kit, basically. It's a, a, the form of a toy kit. And so that's, that's the very playfulness of the, the British Council building in, in, in Bangkok. And I think... Um, just wanted to go back again, and so this is like the culmination of that, um, where uh, at that point, this is uh, about 1983, it was uh, conceived around then, and in his statement, if you read his article on Mimar about the robot building, it is so much, you know, because I, I, I interview him, like, why do you do this? You, you are so critical of postmodernism as a movement, but then you're doing this, why? And I said, well, this is really my critique, because to me, like, uh, the idea of the arbitrariness of form, uh, I might as well exercise it as well. You know, like if I want to be arbitrary, sure, I'll let me just arbitrary to the point of just taking my son's uh, robot toy as the premise of my design. And, and, but then if you ever go to the building, just look at it very closely, it's highly rigorous structurally. Every bolt, every eyes and all that is a function. It's like, a, it's not something that is just completely superficial. And so it's, a, and then of course right now it has become UOB building and it's going to be torn, it might be torn down soon because UOB wants to go up further. And, uh, but then uh, I'm just saying like, it's, yeah, this is an example where he is not afraid um, to really kind of uh, practice or design something that is, that is, that is something that is um, theoretically that he's struggling with basically. And it's not a shame that the fact that, you know, Everybody might hate it or love it, but I just wanted to be able to exercise this. And so this is another building called the Nation Building, uh, where he took it all the way. The idea of the 
superficialness or the arbitrariness, you know, even further. But it's really uh, rooted from his uh, love of painting and also uh, his relationship with the chief editor of the of this of this newspaper, uh, where basically the body, the entire building is based on the silhouette of the friend typing on a desk. Uh, the brain or the cranium is on top, and then the hand, and then the body and the, the legs and all that. You could almost see it. So that's that's how anthropomorphic uh, to the to the ex to the extreme, I guess, this building is. And yet uh, we want to celebrate uh, such a building as well. So it's um, okay. This is just an example of uh, yeah Hong Kong uh, being. I, th I think I'll just what what am I complete times up now? Yeah. This wrap. Yep. Okay. So yeah. So Raj Rawal, um again is another. Uh, yeah, we have acquired a lot of his uh, maybe about seven models of his projects. And if you read up on Raj Rawal, the idea of like how do you kind of classify this person? You know, like or his work. It's not. Yeah. He's. He is one of those that is reacting against the canonical influence of, of Corp and uh, by taking on something that is much more, he actually said it in his, in his, in his description of this work, yes, I, I'm using the Beaux-Arts kind of exil, exil planning, uh, but uh, I think I was looking at like almost, you can almost relate whether these are like, what are, I mean, this is like techno, techno, techno modern or is it like based on like a kind of a very traditional uh, dwelling uh, kind of houses, it's all of that. It's just like you just can't seem to really pin down what exactly it is. And to him, it's, it's really, he, see, he actually mentioned that I am looking at historical forms, but without mimicry. Uh, but is there, there's, this, there's a definite uh, reference to that. And so for him, we, we're going to put this under the POMO section of our opening display, actually, even though people may not put it under that. But again, when I say POMO section, I'm not saying that it's one absolute idea of POMO. It's a, it's a variant, a set of variants. And of course, we also acquired uh, Hall of Nations and all that. So again, these are all uh, forms that are derived from whether it's classical uh, architecture from uh, you know, different parts of India, of, uh, or is it just completely just structural and... Uh, and uh, and really uh, rigorous in its use of glass and all that, you know, there's just many ways of seeing Rawal's work. And I just wanted to end, uh, not end yet, not yet, okay. So, <laughs> so this, is, uh, this is kind of, um, okay, so for those who are industrial design, uh, Shiro Kuramata, this is an example that we have to collect. Basically, if you know about the host Joseph Hoffman's chair, uh, I wish I had put an image here, just Google it. It's like the classic Tonnet Joseph Hoffman chair. But what Kuramata did was he actually put uh, steel wire, uh, bound it with steel wire and then combusted it to the point that all the wood are almost gone and what's left is a little bit of the wood uh, frame and just the steel wire. And for him, uh, this is an example of Pomo in an extreme again where you actually, you actually revisit history, acknowledge it in your work. Sure, I'm not modern, yay, you know, but I am, you know, I'm using a modern icon of a furniture, uh, a highly uh, iconic modern furniture, but I'm adding another layer to it. And this is the kind of uh, a gesture that he is able to uh, I get elevate the sense of the poetic uh, in furniture via all these multiple stories and la uh, layers of, of references, basically, which is what a lot of the Pomo um, narrative-based um, works are all about. And of course, uh, not just his chair, but we acquired his sushi bar. Uh, this is, again, a very, very different kind of uh, approach because it's an interior, it's a real functioning sushi bar, but it's just the precision. Uh, again, I wish I can go on and on about the precision of his craft uh, in this, which is a completely, like, um, the form itself is, yeah, there's many references to, like, uh, using lacquer, you know, or the classic uh, uh, Chinese Ming chair, but being reduced, you know, all these things, but it's all in that, in that sushi bar. And um, I'm, just, I'm just saying this is an example where Pomo can be complex. It's not something that is simplistic or, or just one layer of understanding. And I just say that, again, this is an example where at the moment we would acquire artworks that speaks about completely the, you can call it where the collapse of modernity or whatever that is, you know, but this is part of the story where we are facing right now. It's completely neoliberal. Uh, capitalistic uh, driven kind of uh, a city a production of cities or urbanism and and to us a visual art really speaks of that phenomenon again when we talk about phenomenon visual art could speak and so is design and architecture and moving image and we even acquire photographs like this in shanghai so what is this you know like but we would acquire it because it speaks of a time when architecture is just unable to even differentiate whether it wants to be in a grotto or wants to be in the middle of like was this? I just forgot. This is like uh, Ting An, Ting An in, in, in Shanghai. You know, so it's a, it's a, So I think Bas Princess was very deliberate in capturing this moment of like, okay, a very high skyscraper glass kind of like condo, but in a fake grotto, built out of a fake grotto. Uh, this is how confused we are at the moment. But this is the product of it. And and so I end with this. I think I end with this. Yes, I end with this because uh, again, don't talk about objects, but we acquire objects, and when we acquire objects. We would just end with the fact that, hey, architecture has turned completely objectified and he had just objectified it completely to let it become a completely functional wardrobe. Uh, where, and so this is Li Nai, Li Nai, Li Nai Han's um, 
um, um, um, uh, piece. Uh, of course, it's commission, it has to be commissioned. It's not custom made and not just so much like, you know, available in the market. But it does speak so much about where architecture is today. Um, but at the same time, it is a highly functional wardrobe, however you want to see it. And so, yeah, just the instability of the image, instability of the object. Uh, but at the same time, I'm not saying that we embrace that. I just wanted to quote this a little bit. This is a paraphrase from... Uh, from uh, Paul Greenhall again, it's an old book, but I felt like it was, oh yeah, you know, he actually said that modernism is not a waste, yeah? It still underpins a lot of how we define design or assess design today and architecture today, and it's uh, really issues to do with how it's no longer just about style, no longer about form, it's about their standards, there's ethics in it, they are the notion of the democratization of, of things, where it's meant to break barriers, it's meant to be brought out to the people, it's meant to be, yeah, I guess a sense of dignity and uh, the importance of invention and imagination and the idea to don't be afraid of saying that we can, we can leave behind our old authorities and go into something new. And so these kind of spirit is, until today, I believe, had formed a lot of... Uh, of design and art production. So I think it's something that we want to look for. I'm not saying that we are open at embracing all values. I'm just saying that we are open in expanding meanings, but there are still certain criteria, which is pretty much established by the movement um, that we still uh, believe in. Yeah, so that's my end. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thanks.